Good morning, everyone. My name is Susan Spar with Graybar, and I would like to welcome you to Graybar's G2 Talk presentation on the evolution of in-building networks. We have a great video feed from Jason Green at Coring's Technology Lab lined up for you today. But before we get started, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. First of all, if you were one of the first 50 people who joined in on this presentation, you will receive a coupon for a free cup of coffee courtesy of Graybar as a thank you for your time today. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a box of, for the Q&A. Feel free to submit questions throughout the presentation. We'll address as many questions as time permits at the end of the presentation. In addition, this presentation qualifies for one Bixby CEC credit. If you stay for the entire presentation, you can download your certificate right from this platform. Just click on the ribbon below at the end of the presentation and you can download your certificate. Lastly, our G2 Talks are all archived on gravar.com slash G2 Archive, so you'll be able to view this presentation again or recommend it to others. We're happy to team up today with Corning as a, as a distributor of Corning, Corning Graybar works alongside them to help IT professionals prepare, prepare their networks for the future with new products, solutions, and deployment strategies. You can visit graybar.com to learn more about our solutions. At this time, I'm happy to introduce today's speaker, Jason Green. Jason was appointed Director of Solution Architecture, Corning Optical Communications in March of 2015. In this role, Green is a subject matter expert for the One Platform and is responsible for mapping client, client business objectives to system technical requirements in order to, to deliver a complete solution for the customer. So without further delay, I'd like to turn the presentation over to, to Jason. Take it away, Jason. Welcome. Again, my name is Jason Green. Um, I'm with Corning. I run our um, uh, technical resource team for the one platform. We call it the Solution Architecture Group. And so what we do is we um, uh, design and consult with customers about their network. Uh, so what we're going to be talking about today, uh, the title of this session is um, The Future of In-Building Networks. And, and the two really areas that we see as coming up and coming or the, the newest thing to hit the um, in-building uh, uh, field is software-defined networking, or SDN. Uh, and then where, where we believe it's going in terms of um, enabling the full capabilities of SDN is a high bandwidth, low latency network, which is the, the deep fiber platform um, that we uh, tend to design into systems. Uh, so as we talk about SDN, um, what SDN is, is doing is we're essentially uh, separating out the intelligence uh, from the hardware. So on a traditional network, we have uh, switches and routers, and those switches and routers, um, they have all of the um, intelligence built into the har hardware itself. And so what we do with SDN is now we're separating the intelligence out of that, so now we have uh, what I'll call, you know, dumbish boxes, but we have a more intelligent overall system because now we have this uh, control plane or this orchestration platform, which is a essentially be able to control all of my switches and my routers in a, in a given network. And so as we talk about separating this intelligence away from the hardware, this is not something that's new uh, for us in IT, those of us that have been for, here for a row. So the first time we did this is uh, back in the late 90s. We talked about SANS, or storage area networks. And in storage area networks, if you remember, before storage area networks, uh, when we talked about storing data, we had a, um, a file server. And that file server had hard drives. It had um, access control list. It had an OS. And if anything happened to that box, if a power supply died, if uh, my hard drive got corrupted or damaged, my data was gone. So what we did in 1999 with SANS, um, I was doing this in my, uh, my previous life, um, what we would do is we separated this out. So now I had a uh, control mechanism where I had essentially the brains of the system, and now I had multiple file servers that had this data on it. And with this uh, control mechanism, now I can essentially tell my data where it goes. So now if I have one uh, storage device that fails, I still have my data. Right? So I can essentially, you know, it's backed up and I can go to different file servers. Um, we have also done this with computers. So if you think of computers, in a traditional computer, when we think about computers, we have essentially an OS that's installed on a box or on hardware. And on that hardware, we have, uh, we have hard drives, we have our OS, we have all of the various, um, you know, applications that we want to run on that computer, right, if we, if we go back a while, right? But now, um, you know, nowadays we have what we call virtualization or VMware, where the vast majority of enterprises, I think up to over 80% today, they use virtualization. So now instead of having my computer with all my intelligence on that hard drive, um, you know, if I have a power supply that, that fails or if I get that blue screen that we don't like seeing, 
all my data is safe, right? Because it's actually going up to, uh, it's, it's got some north-south traffic and all that's getting saved, right? So with virtualization, what we did, again, is we pulled out that intelligence. So now if I have a, you know, Windows 12 operating system, as an example, I can have multiple OS sessions going on in the cloud, which is hitting multiple uh, computers or really workstations at this point. So when I say a workstation, I mean if you're a bank teller, uh, you probably don't have a physical computer at your station. You have an x86 box, an Intel 8 x86 box on the back of your monitor, which is connected to a keyboard and a mouse, and, and all of your sessions are going north-south into, uh, into this virtualization kind of computing platform. And so next on the horizon, um, and this has really happened in a big way since about 2013, is this software-defined network. So the software-defined networks, we're doing the same things that we've done already with storage and we've done with computers, and that we're separating the intelligence again away from uh, these boxes. So now I've got, uh, I don't have to have my, I don't have to configure every single router and every single switch if I want to do a change. Now I have this intelligence that gets pulled out, which we call the control plane or an orchestration platform. Now I can control all of my network from one location. So I've got this head of the octopus, and from this head of the octopus, now I can control uh, in a very nuanced way my entire network. So if I want to make a change to my network, I don't have to dive into each router. I can do that from one place and I can push it out to all of my workstations. So what we're going to do, we're going to dive into this a little bit deeper. We're going to shift to the whiteboard and we're going to talk a little bit more about history and I'm going to kind of tie that into a little bit more about you know, how these buildings, uh, buildings are, uh, are, are changing in terms of a technology platform. So with that, we'll go to the whiteboard. All right, tying back into our, uh, to our history lesson. So if we go back to um, 1999, what was important to us in, in IT around 1999, what we were essentially doing is we were, we were transferring files, right? So, um, so when we go back, we think about uh, FTP. So we were transferring videos, we were transferring um, uh, picture files, you know, we were, we were emails, et cetera. So when we talk about 1999 and what was important to us, it was really uh, the size of the pipe, right, or, or bandwidth. So what is bandwidth? Bandwidth is the width of the communications band. So we talk about bandwidth. And why was bandwidth important? Because, you know, we had, uh, you know, big files and we were transferring them back and forth. So that's when we start talking about how, what is the size of your pipe? Is it a five megabit pipe? Is it a one megabit pipe? Is it a T1 service, etc.? Uh, so in 1999, that, that's what was important to us, uh, bandwidth or the size of the pipe. But then if we go forward a couple years, 2005-ish, uh, we had a lot of things that happened to us which kind of changed, uh, changed our IT world a little bit. So when we talk about the, the services that came out in 2005, uh, that's when we had um, a Skype came out around then. We had YouTube. Um, VoIP phones started to become, you know, coming out into the market. And so when we started to talk about Skype, YouTube, or VoIP, we talk about RTC or real-time communications. And so now it's not just transferring files back and forth like we did in 1999. Now what's important is actually the packets, right? So where in 1999 we were transferring big files across the pipe, uh, going back and forth, uh, now we're actually concerned about the individual packets and how they flow across that pipe, right? So when we, when we talk about pipes, what's important in 2005 for Skype, YouTube, and VoIP is latency. And so if we talk, call bandwidth the width of our pipe, latency, we can think about latency as the length of our pipe, okay? And so for Skype, YouTube, VoIP, when we got in 2005, now latency is important. So nice thing about, you know, the, the, what we're talking about here, software-defined networks and deep fiber architectures, uh, bandwidth and latency really play into, uh, into fiber very well. So when you talk about latency uh, and bandwidth, we're measuring this in, um, in megabits, right? So a 5 megabit pipe, a 10 megabit pipe. We talk about la latency, we're talking about time. So maybe this is a 20 millisecond pipe, right? And so... Uh, when you talk about media, you don't get better than fiber, you know, the speed of light in terms of latency. So that's what we were doing in 1999 and 2005. So with latency, uh, what happened here is now we start getting concerning ourselves with quality of service. Uh, so with quality of service, again, we talk about the packet. So it's not only the, um, the size of the pipe, but we want to prioritize our pipe. So when we talk about qu uh, quality of service, we're saying, okay, my SIP traffic or my VoIP traffic is a higher priority than my file transfer, my FTP kind of traffic. And so we want to prioritize in this way because what this allows us to do 
is this allows us to uh, avoid jitter. So in the early days of VoIP, we had jitter, right? Same thing with YouTube and Skype. So we don't want to have, um, you know, if those packets come across in the wrong order, you know, we don't have a good experience. So that's uh, uh, 1999 and 2005. So uh, next, I'm going to flip my board here to get a little bit more room. And when we look to uh, 2011, 2012, 2013, what happens is, you know, essentially, our network starts to get more complicated. So, uh, so now we start talking about um, you know 2011, 2012, 2013 kind of time plane, and now we have many more devices on the network, um, and now it's it's difficult with quality of service. It, it's hard to say that SIP traffic. When we talk about quality of service again, you know, before I drew out, uh, we were saying okay, well, SIP traffic is more important. And FTP traffic, but when we get to 2011, 2012, 2013 with all the devices on the network, sometimes it might be that SIP is not my most important thing. And so I want to be able to um, basically use the full pipe that I have. So when we talk about bandwidth, when we're talking about prioritizing these, uh, these patterns, basically what happens is I say uh, part of that bandwidth pipe is dedicated for this, part of that bandwidth pipe is dedicated for this, you know, this might be a higher priority, but what it doesn't allow me to do, it doesn't allow me to necessarily use my full pipe. So when we talk about VoIP traffic, sometimes maybe I'm using 70% of my pipe, but sometimes I might be using 5% or 0% of my pipe. So what software-defined networking is going to allow us to do, it's going to allow us to start to shape that traffic. And so if we tie this back to software-defined networking, uh, we, t we typically talk about two planes. We talk about the data plane. And so when I say data plane, Think of data plane as your physical routers and your physical switches in a, in a network, right? And so what are the, um, the routers and switches doing in your network there? They're moving the, uh, the, 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 the data from point A to point B, okay? And so these are my switches in a traditional network, all the intelligence, right? We talk about pulling the intelligence away from the hardware and software-defined networking. In the traditional network, the intelligence is built into those routers and built into those switches. So we have in SDN, we have uh, we separate the control plane from the data plane. So now I got the control plane. So you can think of the control plane as being essentially the intelligence or the brains of the um, of the of the network, right? So what the control plane does is that now I now it communicates, you know, to all of my routers and all of my switches at the same time. So what that allows me to do in a very nuanced way, now I can shape my traffic. So if um, let's say my, my CEO calls and says, hey, I've got an important conversation coming up with a client and I want you to jump on a video chat with me. Well, to use that video chat, maybe I need to download an application onto my device on my tablet. Uh, so now at this given time, um, you know, SIP is not the most important thing to me. The most important priority for me at this given time is downloading that app. And so what, what SDN allows me to do in real time, it allows me to kind of shape my traffic and now I'm, I'm able to use my full pipe. So no longer can I say, well, I can't tap into that pipe because I've already got you know, this much bandwidth associated with my VoIP phone, even if I'm not using that VoIP zone. I, I can shape it in real time. So that's what, uh, that's what SDN is, uh, is doing. So with that, I think we're going to, um, to pause again and we'll start looking at the, uh, the actual... Okay, so now you're thinking, Jason, you know, this sounds great. Now I can shape my traffic, but what is a reason that I'd want to shape my traffic, right? So right now, you know, I have my, my big sys switches, my big routers, you know, um, understand that with quality of service, uh, you know, I have to set my priorities. But what's a, what's a, a real-world scenario where I want to change my, um, the way my uh, traffic flows? So, so the first uh, example that I'll give you is day traders. So I, if you think about day traders, what they're doing is we talked about bandwidth and latency. So for a day trader, you know, bandwidth is not so important to them, right? Uh, because again, they're not, they're not sending massive files back and forth, but latency is super important to them, right? So if I'm a day trader, holding on to a stock for 10 minutes might be a long time, right? So when I click that button to buy a stock or to sell a stock, I want it to be instantaneous. So we talk about milliseconds, right? So now we want to have that, we want to have a fiber environment. We want that to be very fast, right? Because when that day trader hits the button, he wants to have a very low latency system. It wants to be instantaneous. But if I'm a day trader house, I might be willing to pay a big premium for that low latency service, right? I'm making a lot of money. No big deal if I have to pay a lot of money for that service, but I don't want to have to pay for it after hours, right? So maybe I can have some kind of setup where between nine and five when I'm trading, or maybe I only trade in the morning, 
you know, I can actually shape my traffic pattern where I say the priority for me, you know, during uh, trading hours is, you know, is that button click, right? I want that button click to be instantaneous. But after that, maybe my SIP traffic is more important. Maybe I've got some FTP traffic that's more important. It's not the most critical thing. So again, I can shape my traffic depending on what I want to do. Um, another example um, that I think about is a call center. So in a call center, if we think about a call center today, I, I, I'm sure m most people have seen a call center. You have a lot of uh, employees sitting in a room and they're, they're answering the phone. So in that case, on a call center, it's pretty intuitive to think from a quality of service standpoint, the most important tr thing is my VoIP traffic, right? If they're using VoIP phones, or maybe they're using a soft phone on their computer. So that particular um, um, application is mo the most critical thing for a call center. But, you know, we, we're, we're in IT, right? So we got to think about, you know, years ahead. And it, maybe it's not even that many years ahead, where maybe it's not good enough for me to talk to somebody uh, in my call center. Maybe I want to video chat with them. Right, so maybe for very important customers, I want a video chat. So you can you can imagine where I might want to shape my traffic depending on who makes that phone call. If the phone call comes in as a voice phone call, then I want that to be the highest priority. If it comes in as a video chat, maybe that's a more important customer, or for whatever reason, I want that to be my highest priority. So that's another example of where I want to shape that traffic, which with uh, with SDN, which allow me to do in these kind of deep fiber architectures. Um, the last example that I that I'm going to give is uh, telesurgery. Right, so when you think about telesurgery, right, so now I'm, um, you know, I'm doing surgery and the doctor is not in the room, right, you know, so again, we, we got to think about a couple years out. So, you know, so now maybe I'm using a robot, maybe I'm using an assistant that's going to help me, but the guy that's actually calling the shots is not in the room with me, right, and so in a hospital, at any given time, you know, I might want to shape that traffic in different ways, but when I'm doing an important surgery and my doctor is off-site, you better believe that that's going to be my number one priority. So again, just another example of how we're able to uh, shape the traffic and we're able to do that in real time or real time communications, RTC. Okay, so now we've talked about a couple of examples. So now what we're going to do is we're going to start looking at the actual equipment that we deploy on site. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to set the stage. I'm going to draw out uh, some of the network topologies that we typically will design in my group. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll, uh, we'll take you to some of the actual kind of scenarios that we have in the lab so you can see this kind of uh, actually w in a working environment. Okay, so before we start looking at the real equipment, sometimes it's helpful to, um, to uh, kind of schematic out what we're going to see. Uh, so the first thing you're going to see is um, what we call a top of rack switch, or TOR. So, so this is going to be performing my, uh, my routing function. Uh, again, a software-defined router. Uh, so when you see this, what you're going to notice is it's a 1RU uh, 48-port switch. So what we have on the switch is we have uh, many SFP ports, or small form pluggable. So small form pluggable is just a standard, so I can plug in a RJ45 connection, I can plug in a single-mode fiber connection, a multi-mode fiber connection, whatever is the most convenient for my application. Uh, so the purpose in life of this uh, top of rack switch is this is going to be my connection point to all my applications. So in the lab, what you'll see is I have some copper connections. These copper connections are going to some local uh, controllers. So as an example, uh, we have a, a controller for Wi-Fi. So whether it's a, a Ruckus Wi-Fi or um, Aruba or Cisco, I have a local controller in this case. Uh, we also have our um, COM2000 IPTV solution. So that's got a, a copper connection as well. So it's going to come in and uh, connect to my topper rack switch via copper SFP. Uh, and then the, then the various other applications. We have a, a call manager for my VoIP traffic as well, which has a local connection. Um, also with the SDN, we have virtual apps. So we have the ability to virtualize some of these apps. So as an example, instead of having a hard, um, you know, in the rack Wi-Fi controller, I might have an option where I have something that's in the cloud. So maybe I have some other kind of app that's in the cloud here, right, and it's just getting a LAN connection into my topper rack switch. So again, everything's software defined and makes it very flexible. The next box that you'll see on the rack is what we call in our terminology an aggregation switch, or AGR. So when you look at the switch in the rack, it'll become obvious that it's physically the exact same switch. So again, it's another 48-port switch, okay? Where the purpose of the top of the rack switch is my connection to my various applications, so this is my routing. Uh, the aggregation switch is my distribution point. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect this aggregation switch to my top of rack switch. Um, I'll use a single mode fiber here. So typically, you know, when convenient, we'll use a copper connection to some of these local uh, controllers just because that's their 
uh, the connection point. Um, typically what we'll try to do when we leave that topper rack switch, we're going to want to use as much single mode fiber as we can, again, for this high bandwidth, low latency. That's kind of our universal media that works for uh, all connections. So I'll say I've got a single mode SFP, uh, which is going to connect to my aggregation switch. So now my aggregation switch is connect, uh, connected via SFP. And I can uh, connect, you know, multiple aggregation switches, just ho however large my system is. So uh, in the lab here, uh, we have an aggregation switch which is in the same rack as a top of rack switch. This would be common for, um, we do this a lot in hospitality for mid-tier hotels. So 100-room hotels, 150-room hotels, where typically, you know, they're three or four stories. Makes sense to serve everything from one closet. That allows us to minimize IDF closets, potentially get another hotel room out of the mix. Um, but in some cases, if it's a resort property, as an example, I want to use that single mode fiber. Again, I'm not distance limited because I'm fiber. You know, maybe I want to connect that aggregation switch in a, uh, in a different IDF closet or even in a different building. If it's a resort, maybe it's multiple buildings. So that's what we're doing with the aggregation switch. Again, I've got that connection into the top of rack, so now I have access to all of my applications, um, and now I'm going to distribute that out. So when I distribute it out, I'm going to use um, the first uh, example I'll use is active Ethernet. So for active Ethernet, I'm going to use, a, uh, in this example, a bi-directional SFP, so a single fiber, small form, plug pluggable SFP. Uh, and then I'm going to have a fiber connection again, which is going to go all the way out to my in location. And at my in location, um, I will have an optical network terminal, uh, ONT, or you can think about that as just a switch. So uh, this is a point-to-point -point connection. In the case of the lab, um, all of these connections are, are gigabit. Right, so I have a full gigabit that's going over to my ONT. At that ONT, uh, in that uh, hotel in, uh, example that I gave, maybe I've got a, a port which is a LAN connection going to a computer. I have a connection that's going to a Wi-Fi access point, and maybe there's a connection to a, uh, to a VoIP phone, as an example. Okay. But in some applications, uh, when we start about technology, again, the SDN platform, we're talking about SDN here, is very flexible, so we support multiple technologies. So active Ethernet being one option. Uh, another option would be uh, passive optical LAN, or, or POL or PON, passive optical networks. So in that case, again, we're just going to uh, utilize uh, SFP ports. So in the case of PON, I'm going to have an OLT SFP. And uh, again, it's single mode fiber out, so single mode fiber throughout. I'm going to go down, and now instead of being point to point, it's going to be point to multipoint. Okay, so point to multipoint. Okay, so one fiber leaving, and this fiber hits an optical splitter. What an optical splitter is, is get a single fiber in and multiple fibers out. Um, in this case, uh, I'm going to use an example as a 1 by 32 splitter, a common splitter that we would use indoors, uh, but we have many varieties. And so now, uh, let's say the application is, it, maybe in this application, maybe it's a hospital, uh, and there's, an, there's a Bluetooth location. So Bluetooth location tends to be you know, low bandwidth, uh, so I don't need a full gigabit pipe to feed each of those ONTs. So now I'm going to have many ONTs that get connected via that same fiber port out of my, uh, my, out of my head and equipment. And so now this ONT is going to feed some locators as an example, right? And from there I can feed many ONTs, right? So the key of this is the flexibility that both the, the software-defined network provides, right? So again, I can, um, now with the software-defined network, as we talked about earlier, I'm able to tune my traffic depending on, on the real time. So, um, and then I also, from a technology standpoint, I can bring a, a big pipe and not, not share at all, or I can bring a, a pipe and I can share just depending on what I want to do. Uh, the beauty with the software-defined network, again, is now in real time, I can kind of use the, the full size of my pipe, right? If, if location is the more important at one given time, I can prioritize that versus other applications. So with that, what we're going to do is we're going to stop over and uh, stop looking at the stick diagram. All right, so now this is the, uh, the equipment the, that I drew on the whiteboard. Now we're going to see it in, uh, in real life. So what you see here at the, the top of the rack, this is the top of the rack switch that I referenced. So this is performing my routing function. So, um, so I've got, I've got uh, it's software defined. So the software function is um, it, it, the routing function is all via software. And so what you'll see is I have some uh, SFP slots, right? SFP is small form pluggable, as we mentioned, and I've got some copper connections. So I've got copper connections. Each of these are going to a physical controller. 
that's in the lab, right? So I have some local controllers in the lab, and then I also have some virtual apps. The so virtual apps, you know, now, now those are going off into the cloud, and I, cloud, and I just have a LAN connection, uh, uh, essentially giving me the um, that application to my network. All right, so this is my my top of rack switch with my routing. Uh, next below here, you'll see this is my aggregation switch. So quickly, you'll see physically these two switches are exactly the same, just performing different functions via software. So I have a fiber connection which is connecting my top of rack switch, which is my brains, which is my connection to all my applications, all my services. That's connecting down to my aggregation switch. The aggregation switch is now my distribution point. So I'm distributing the, uh, all the services to my various uh, ONTs or switches throughout the, uh, throughout the lab. So here what you'll see is I have bi die optics. So, so here's a, uh, the SFP, so just a single fiber out. And this is my gigabit SFP, which is ultimately serving um, gigabit ONTs that are uh, throughout the lab that we'll show you here in a second. Um, what, I'll, what I'm also showing in the rack is a OLT. So this is a rack-based OLT. So this OLT is my, where my active Ethernet is point to point. My, my PON is uh, point to multipoint. And so this is an OLT. I have my SFP. Uh, OLT port here, right? So this fiber is going to ultimately hit an optical splitter uh, and serve multiple ONTs in the system. Um, the router for this OLT is still the same top of rack switch. So I'm performing the routing function for this um, OLT as well. At the very bottom of your rack, you'll see this is my, uh, in the lab, we also have our cellular DAS throughout. And so again, this is part of the converged system as well. Uh, if you look at the left-hand side of this uh, box, we call this an integrated head in unit. The left-hand side is my connection into my services. In the case of DAS, my services are AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, Sprint, et cetera. Uh, so this is my connection into their radios. On the right-hand side, this is acting very similar to the aggregation switch. This is my distribution. So I have fiber out of this box, uh, which is ultimately serving my remote antenna units, which is providing my cellular coverage uh, throughout the lab. So, uh, so now I'm going to go to the right-hand side of the rack. This is where we're doing all our distribution. So um, I've got fiber, again, out of my cellular system. I've got fiber out of my pawn. I've got fiber out of my aggregation switch. That's all going to go to my patch panel here on the right side of the rack. And so for my point-to-point -point connections, uh, I simply have a jumper, which is going to the patch, which is going to go out the back, which is going to hit uh, various areas of my, my lab. We have different verticals that we're showing. So my point-to-point -point connections is simply just a patch. Uh, I have my point to point, point to multipoint uh, with the via the pawn. So in that case, I have the uh, pawn optic is leaving, which is hitting the optical splitter. So when we drew that on the board, the optical splitter, I drew that as a triangle, one fiber in, multiple fibers out. What that looks like in real life is a panel. And so I've got a single fiber feeding the optical splitter, and then that gets split out to, in this case, up to 32 ONTs. And I have, in this case, three ONTs that are uh, running here in the lab. Then on the far right-hand side of the, of the panel, this is my, my copper distribution for the power. So in the lab, all of my devices are remotely powered. And so we have two ways that we're powering uh, the various uh, uh, systems, two, two products we offer. One is the power supply unit, or the PSU. So the power supply unit is, uh, has uh, a bunch of 100-watt circuits. And so these black connections, you'll see I've got a black connection that leaves that patches up here and that's leaving via composite cable. So out the back of this box, I have my fiber connectivity and I have my power. Uh, so I have copper and fiber under the same sheath, which is feeding a uh, composite cable to feed, to power my ONTs and my remote antenna units for cellular. Um, but then I also have digital electricity. So we have in the lab, we have a public venue setup, which would be, um, in this case, we're simulating like a football stadium. So we have a, a a lot of power needed at a single location. In that case, I'll use my digital electricity product. So with digital electricity, I can bring up to 1,000 watts uh, of power to a receiver on the other side. Uh, and that receiver can actually accept 2,000 watts of power. So I can have, I can have two uh, pairs feed uh, a receiver for up to 2,000 watts, or I can just bring a single pair and I get 1,000 watts to that location and still stay within my electrical code um, because this is digital electricity. So we're actually pulsing that electricity and bringing it back down to analog electricity when we get back to the box. So with that, uh, we'll pause again and we'll start looking at the uh, individual verticals uh, in the lab. Okay, so now we're at our end devices. So this is our, um, our example for a hotel room. Uh, could be a, a patient room in a hospital, a dorm room if it's a public education. Uh, and so if I open the curtain here, you'll see kind of the smarts of the system that are behind. So what I have is a composite cable that's feeding this. Again, that's getting fed, in this case, by the power supply unit, or the PSU. So a uh, 
one fiber two conductor cable is feeding this wall plate okay and now out the front I have a fiber connection which is providing my high bandwidth low latency connection and I have my copper connection which is just physically powering that ONT so so this fiber jumper and this copper is going into my optical network terminal this is getting fed by that aggregation switch we talked about so we've got a gigabit SFP that's feeding this ONT out of the ONT I have in this case four PoE ports power over Ethernet and I'm connecting to various devices that would be in, to, in my hotel room again or my patient room or dorm room uh, so I've got one connection that's coming over here to my set top box my set top box is driving my IPTV I've got one uh, category cable that's coming out feeding my wireless access point so this is the wireless access point for the room uh, and then I have another connection which is going here to the left which is going to a VoIP phone okay so there's just some applications that are all running via the lab and so um, quickly I can do a quick de de um, demonstration of what we're doing here so so here's my hotel so one thing that uh, hotelers are looking for now is now we carry our content with us right no longer do we want to walk into a room and flip through the channels you know we want to use our Netflix again north to south traffic I want to connect to that Netflix server or Hulu or YouTube or whatever that happens to be so what I can do is I can take my phone and I can say okay I'm going to Chromecast and I just hit my uh, Chromecast button here and you'll see that I'll start Chromecasting my, my content right so again so now my device you know is, is what's coming with me I got the north to south traffic flow what's important there is low latency right I don't want to have any jitter on this screen so I want to have a high bandwidth low latency connection and this is uh, kind of the setup that we would do in hospitality so this is an example of a project where we would deploy a uh, software defined network fiber rich architecture and in this case we're supporting IPTV uh, Wi-Fi and uh, and VoIP or voice over IP all right so now we're gonna walk over to the other side of the uh, the um, lab and I'll show you an another uh, example of a uh, of a deployment architecture okay so here's some other deployment options that we are uh, we're showing off in the lab uh, so this is actually a, another uh, mock-up that we did for a customer. This happens to be a hotel as well, but you can imagine this could be a uh, enterprise office building. Uh, but what you'll see is uh, this is a media enclosure, and inside the media enclosure, in this case, I have a four-fiber, four-conductor composite cable feeding this box. And so what they've done is in each uh, room in this case, they have this uh, media enclosure with four-fiber, four-conductors. And what this allows us to do is this allows us to scale and because I've got this fiber connection you know we don't necessarily have to think about what we need today we can think about what we need five years from today so uh, so what we have out, out of the gate is I have a, a single ONT that ONT gives me four um, power over Ethernet ports so in a hotel case that could be going to a TV it could be going to a Wi-Fi access point it could be going to a VoIP phone as an example we have a VoIP phone set up here in this example uh, also in, in some of these uh, hotels are also using uh, plain old telephone service or just standard uh, SIP traffic so we also have a uh, standard telephone right here that we're also showing uh, in, in this case but again so you have your your ONT uh, you have your punch downs in this case they wanted to see punch downs that are uh, allowing for my my IP connections and my telephone connections uh, but what we also can do here is, is you'll see this is where my fiber is coming in I've got my my copper uh, splice there which is just for the connectivity for to powering that ONT uh, but you'll see I've got four conductors so I've got up to in this case uh, 200 watts of power that's hitting this box um, and then I've got a single fiber that's going to my ONT and then I have this other fiber so in this case in this hotel uh, every I would say eight rooms or so is also feeding a remote antenna unit for the cellular system for the DAS okay so in this case we've got this inside the room in the closet and in uh, about every eight rooms uh, we've got a fiber connection a fiber pair which is coming out uh, also the power is coming out and it's feeding a remote antenna unit which is in the hallway right outside of that room this is connecting to a low po profile uh, DAS antenna as an example so again in this box you know as things change as they need uh, you know uh, new devices you know we can add an ONT if we choose to we can add a remote antenna unit so today you know we talk 4G but when we look at 5G now we have smaller cells we have more bands so maybe uh, instead of having a remote every eight rooms maybe I need it every four rooms or every other room or every room right things change but with this high bandwidth you know connection into my room essentially I can scale so now one cable to come in to feed everything versus you know four eight or ten uh, copper connectors coming into the room so that's my uh, um, 
kind of the hotel scenario there. Um, this large box here to my um, to uh, your right here is a uh, stadium application. Okay, so uh, so this would be something that we've deployed a lot of large um, you know football stadiums, basketball arenas, public venues, and so in this case I've got um, a remote antenna unit which is providing my cellular coverage for my carriers, um, and I also have a, a Cisco switch. So this Cisco switch is getting fed off of that aggregation switch that we showed you back in the, in the rack. So again, very flexible system. Uh, I want to use a bi-die optic to feed my ONT. In this case, I use a standard duplex SFP to feed my Cisco switch. Okay, but I've got my Cisco switch. This happens to be a 12-port switch. Um, and I also have, in this case, I have some ONTs. So really what I'm showing is kind of two scenarios. Scenario one would be uh, cellular remote with a, a Cisco switch as an example. Maybe another customer still wants a cellular remote, but he wants to run it via PON and do a point-to-point -point connection as, as an example. But uh, in this box, I need lots of power, right? So you see here, I, this is a 12-port switch. So if I got 12 ports of PoE plus a remote antenna unit, you know, plus in this case an ONT, I'm exceeding 100 watts really quick. And so this is that connection that's getting fed by my digital electricity connection. And so you'll see I have a single copper connector coming in, or copper pair, which is feeding my digital electricity receiver. And then from this receiver, I'm powering, in this case, my ONT, my remote antenna unit, and my Cisco switch, which is providing PoE. So just another architecture that we support over the uh, SDN platform. Thank you again for your uh, attentiveness. Um, again, uh, what we're talking about today is the evolution of, um, of building technology and how a deep fiber network in combination with a software-defined network can really benefit, uh, we think, a lot of these enterprises and various uh, verticals that we cover. Uh, again, my name is uh, Jason Green, um, and I'm happy to answer uh, questions. Thank you, Jason. That was an excellent insight into Corning's technology lab. At this time, we would like to address some questions that have been submitted. As a reminder, you can submit a question using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. If we don't get to your question, a Graver representative would follow up with you after the presentation. And wow, we got a lot of questions that came in. So here's question number one. Jason, what is your prediction for PON, POL adoption in the enterprise over the next five years? Uh, sure, great question. Thank you. Um, I think PON is a is a great technology, and and, and what I see as a future is I, I think it'll really be a mix depending on uh, the needs of the venues and the applications that we're supporting. So, um, you know, I see you know in the future instead of uh, you know going all active Ethernet or all, all uh, G PON, it'll be more of a mix. So, as an example, uh, maybe at a hospital, I want to have some dedicated uh, gigabit uh, links or active Ethernet links going to. Uh, MRI machines or to, you know, to maybe the nurses' stations because there are some critical applications that they're running or the doctor's offices, et cetera. But in that same facility, I might have um, Bluetooth location, right? Bluetooth location is something that we support um, on our designs as well. So, you know, those Bluetooth locators, uh, really powerful tools right now. I can track uh, things throughout the hospital. Maybe that's uh, uh, medical equipment. Maybe it's the, the babies that just got born, right? But but from a technology standpoint, very low bandwidth. So I probably don't want to waste one of my gigabit ports on a locator because that locator is so low bandwidth. So, so I guess where I see the future is I see it, you know, kind of heterogeneous network. I see a mix. I see I think uh, active Ethernet will be used in many applications, uh, but at that same venue, I think uh, we'll use PON as well. So uh, I really see a mix. Great, thanks. Okay, I got another question. What is the difference between SDN and OpenFlow? Oh, great question. Okay, someone's been studying up. Uh, so uh, OpenFlow is a protocol. So if you think of uh, software-defined networking, uh, so SDN is, is the software itself, which gives uh, the IT professionals or the network administrators a console or, or what we call in our terminology an orchestration platform, where from that one GUI, right, or that orchestration platform, now I can control uh, my data plane or all my routers, all my switches in the network. So, so that's what SDN is. OpenFlow is the uh, protocol or API. So, so you can think of OpenFlow as the uh, the language that's used uh, or, or most commonly used when we're configuring an SDN. So they're really uh, linked together. All right. Here's another question. What are examples of virtual apps you can support? Okay, uh, so it's it's really endless. It's, it's that's one of the beauties about SDN. So I, I think of SDN as almost you can think about it like the uh, 
the Apple App Store, right, where, you know, literally we're kind of uh, opening it up to whatever uh, whatever people want to uh, invent or whatever they want to, you know, support on the network. Uh, you know, what we see today most commonly, uh, you know, firewalls typically will, will, will be a, um, a virtualized app. Um, wireless controllers, uh, we'll, we'll see that too. So instead of having a, uh, uh, as an example, a, um, a physical controller that you would sit on uh, in the rack, you know, you can also virtualize that. Um, let's see, other examples would be call managers. So, so sometimes on these uh, these small hotels, you know, instead of having a, a physical uh, call manager on site, uh, we'll virtualize that in the app as well for internal calls. Um, you know, the access gateways, so the gateways that control, again, another hospitality application that control uh, how much bandwidth can have at a given room. So uh, I get uh, free Internet um, up to a certain speed, but I want to have, uh, you know, for uh, – for paying five dollars, you know, I, I can um, I can get higher speed. So that's another you know application that we can virtualize. Uh, and then the big one, I, I guess, is routing in, in itself. So the routing functionality. Uh, so typically, you know, when when you're looking at a traditional network, the router is a physical box. Uh, now that router itself can be a uh, a virtual app uh, and be can controlled via software. Uh, many more I could I could pick up, but those are some some good ones off the top of my head. Great, thanks. Um, a question just came in: Are SPF ONTs currently available? Uh, yes, they are. So, uh, so we offer SFP ONTs. So, uh, so when we say SFP ONTs for everybody, um, so that would mean if my end device has an SFP cage. Uh, so, when we when we showed you uh, on the video, you saw that I had a, a bare metal switch with SFPs. Um, at the at the head end or at that main rack, so so that would be um, you know similar at the end device. So if I have a a camera that has an SFP cage, I could uh, put in the SFP ONT and avoid that um, that last transition point from um, from O to E essentially. Uh, so we are starting to work with manufacturers. Um, I think um, you know the whole idea of this fiber being the universal media and uh, knowing that you know we don't have really um, practical limits in terms of the bandwidth, so that's that's something we see at Corning as, as being a trend. So we are working with a lot of uh, uh, in-device manufacturers um, uh, on these uh, SFP cages, and, and, and that is something that we do offer today. Okay, thanks. Okay, another question's come in. Um, does Corning offer an, an SDN solution? Oh, good question. Uh, we do. So. Uh, we have uh, we, that's uh, the SDN solution is part of our larger one platform. So the the one platform is our um, our network solution, which um, you know which supports uh, you know you know optical LAN essentially, which 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 we're supporting via this SDN platform that we've talked about today. Um, you know we also support applications that are analog like cellular. Uh, so uh, the the SDN is kind of our you know one of our LAN options across the the one platform that we offer. All right. Okay, another question came in about SDN. There are, is a lot of talk about SDN in the market today. Why does Corning believe this is the way of the future? Okay. Good question. So, so when you look at our, you know, or the way we see the world, um, you know, and this I think applies to the one platform, but just in general, uh, you know, the core of our platform is the ability to provide that high bandwidth, low latency pipe that we talked about. So that that fiber connection. Uh, now I can bring fiber. I can also bring power via our composite cables, and and uh, that can be done with uh, with low voltage, right? Just with the PSU, you know, less than 100 watts, or uh, as we showed you for that um, football stadium example. We can bring you know a uh, thousand watts over you know using digital electricity. So really, we we feel like the the the, the core of the platform is this you know high bandwidth, low latency uh, infrastructure. Okay, um, but what's gonna so so now we've got this big pipe and we can do lots of stuff with the pipe. Um, so but but the value is going to come in and really the the te the software right. So to me, the software is really the technology and what's enabling that that is the that low latency pipe. So so we. So we're actually pretty excited, right? So when you think about it, um, you know, in a traditional network, we always can kind of think about the, the the key parts of my network are these hardware boxes, and I think what's happening now is that's kind of getting flipped a little bit, and that really the the key part of my uh, my network is really what I want to do with that network. As long as I have the plumbing in the building, right? You know, we don't we don't. Uh, uh, we don't plumb a building for five years, right? We plumb a building for the lifetime of the building. When we're pulling that fiber cable and that high bandwidth, uh, you know, low latency pipe, we're doing the same thing. And, and now the software can sit on top of that, and you know, we don't have to worry about what's going to happen ten years from now because that same fiber 
that I'm pulling to the end device, you know, is, is the same essentially fiber that hadn't changed a whole lot uh, where we're running, you know, transoceanic uh, kind of uh, applications. So, so yeah, that's that's where we see it. You know, we, we feel like, um, you know, historically, you know, if we look back to the 70s, right, we're pulling fiber to buildings and we start pulling fiber to the, the riser. Now we see it uh, going horizontally, and we think to, to keep track with that, it, it's really going to be a software-defined network kind of um, kind of a network. That was kind of a long answer, but uh, hopefully that was helpful. Yeah, it was very helpful. Um, a question just came in. Any heat issues with 1,000 watts? Uh, no. So, um, so what we do with our digital electricity? So digital electricity. Um, so that's uh, that meets you know kind of the national electric code. So basically, what we're doing is we're we're pulsing the um, the electricity. So basically, uh, that that, um, that that we're pulsing it 700 times a second. So basically, the way that works is. Um, you know, it can go under the same sheath. It goes under composite cabling. Um, it can be installed by a um, low voltage kind of contractor. Uh, so basically, what we do is we're that's that's where we're converting it to digital, right? So we're converting it to digital, pulsing that power, and then at the end, at the receiver that you saw in the um, when we were on video, that's converting it back to to analog. But um, yeah, no. To answer the question, there's there's not a uh, a heat issue uh, with the uh, with the platform. Well, I had a couple other questions asking about you to define digital electricity, so I think um, you pretty much covered it there. Um, I have another question that came in. I see the need to conserve space, but there still needs to be dedicated space, room for IT. Do you agree? I do. So, so oftentimes, you know, what we do on these designs is, you know, we we give them back space, you know, and. And uh, sometimes they'll use that space, and sometimes they won't. But but I'm uh, you know I, I've been around for a long time too. So it, it, it typically uh, uh, you know there's resistance to give away space. But you know if you get extra space, it's always a good thing. And, and an example I can give you on some of our very large public venues, these um, you know football stadiums and things, we've given them back space, and they've used that for the audio visual equipment, right? So they had some speakers that weren't running through through our system, um, and so. You know, I think all of us have been into IT closets where you can hardly walk into the door. So, um, so I think you can minimize those closets if it's a, if it's a greenfield application. You can get rid of them, but uh, uh, I think you still um, you know want some kind of aggregation point at some point just to uh, you know as patch points for the for the fiber and those kind of things. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't think the closets go away. I think now they can be used for different things. I think uh, now you don't need as much power in that closet. Uh, you don't have to have the cooling in that closet, but um, certainly um, you know. When there when there's a closet, it tends to get used. Okay, great. Um, I have another question about SDN. Can I use SDN to centrally manage a large network across multiple venues? Yes. So so that's really one of the the real beauties of of the SDN. So so as we mentioned uh, earlier, we're separating the control plane and the data plane. The control control plane being uh, the intelligence, right? So so what the control plane is doing. Is it's um, it's determining where traffic is going to be sent, okay? And then on the data plane, that that's the one that's actually forwarding that traffic. And so if you think about it in those two platforms, the control plane is is software, right? So that can sit that can sit up in the, in the cloud. So if I have uh, we're, we're working with a large retailer now that has 2,000 stores, right? And so when you know on a traditional network, it, it was kind of a nightmare for them when they made changes, right? Because just in life, we know that there's always going to be changes, right? The things that we're doing today are going to be different than five years from now. But what they had to do previously, right? They have to go on site. They have to they have to log into the uh, CLI command code. They have to go in and they have to adjust the router, adjust their switches, um, you know, on, on every site. And when you have 2,000 sites, you know, it's it's just a nightmare, right? And, and th this particular retailer, you know, he doesn't have an IT professional on every site. And so what the SDN allows you to do is now you've got these. Um, you know, I'll, I'll call them dumbish boxes, right, um, on site, and all the intelligence is up in the on the control plane, right, on the orchestration platform where where I can hit and I can hit that from anywhere, right. And so now instead of having to go to every single router, make adjustments, every single switch, make adjustments, what I can do is I can essentially push out those changes via the orchestration platform from the control plane. The control plane is going to send that traffic to the data plane or the routers, which is then going to again tell tell the data you know where to go. But great question. But I think that's one of the big the big values. All right, thanks. Um, we have one more question that just came in. We have other questions, but we only have time for one more question. 
As cloning deployed a one platform in a hospital that wants Wi-Fi and cellular and mission critical apps such as telemet telemetry and management of the hospital rooms with all with all call controls and Bluetooth for locators, and you have a like a case study that has been created for this application. Uh, yes, yeah, so let me. Yes, yeah, so we have um, we have deployed a system Wi-Fi, cellular, mission critical, telemetry. Um, I think the site that I'm thinking of does not have the Bluetooth on it, but uh, certainly would just be an application that we could add. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, historically for Corning, uh, you know, healthcare is one of our really strong uh, verticals, um, and we have deployed um, the one solution in the, in the, and certainly in the hospitals. And, and uh, I can't think of I, I, I've got a site that I know we've done that has location, but I don't know that it also has the uh, telemetry. And then we have another site that has the telemetry, the Wi-Fi, and cellular. So um, again, you know, when we look at the one platform, um, you know, we think of this as our networking platform that supports many applications. Uh, certainly not a challenge to kind of do those things. Um, and uh, yeah, be happy to speak to anybody about a specific project if that's something they, they have in mind maybe after. Okay, great. Well, we'll get you in contact with this person that asked the question. So we're kind of running out of time now. So at this time, you can now click on the ribbon below and download your Bixby certificate for all of you that have been on this webinar. Um, so we, as I said, we're almost out of time. Don't forget to uh, download the big CECs. And if you um, didn't get any of your questions answered, we will have a Gray Bar representative follow up with you after the presentation. As a reminder, the presentation will be archived on Gray Bar slash G2 Archive. Again, thank you so much for your time today. And we hope you will join us again next month for Gray Bar's G2 Talk.